Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,141. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest, Richard Peppy. Richard, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Absolutely. <laughs> All the time. Richard Peppy and his best friend, Frank DiPaolo, founded the Carmel Mission Classic, a Concours event that is held during Car Week in August at the, a 300-year-old Spanish mission in Carmel, California. I attended this year, and oh my gosh, well, I've attended for the last few years, I'll have to say, it is a fantastic event. He is a retired New York City Police Department officer. Thank you for your service very much, Rich. Thank you. Who has worked as an EMT in law enforcement and the Highway Patrol, among many other things. He caught the car bug early in life, and his quest to go fast came in handy while working in the Highway Patrol. Doing it legally, I might say. (laughs) He started organizing car shows in the parking lot of the St. Columbus, I should say Columbinus Church, I'll say that right, or the uh, the nuns there will slap me on the on the knuckles with their uh, <laughs> rulers. We'll give you a special dispensation, don't there, worry. There you go. That led to the Carmel Mission Classic, and they have raised close to a quarter million dollars to the Knights of Columbus and their charities. Pretty cool for two kids from Brooklyn. He also put together the unique Pixville Vintage Grand Prix on the banks of the Hudson River. We're going to hear a little bit about that. And today, Rich works at the Deutsche Bank overseeing health and safety for all the bank's offices located throughout the United States, Canada, and Latin America. Rich's motto is, cars are made to be driven. So, Rich, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a brief moment before we jump into the questions and share a little bit more about your career and a very obvious passion for automobiles? Yeah, I mean, passion is uh, obviously the the word that uh, brings all us car guys and car girls together. It's uh, something that uh, bit me at a very early age. I have one older brother. He's uh, seven years older than me, and I was kind of his grease monkey, gopher, uh, as he was uh, drag racing in in the old days as he was growing up. And just, you know, the sights, the sounds, the smell of uh, burning rubber, grease, oil and watching these cars move just you know it got into me and mom wasn't too thrilled about that but um, (laughs) i think it turned out good you know i I went for a career in law enforcement and almost as soon as i uh, was on uh, the force i was very fortunate enough to get assigned to the highway patrol you paid me to drive fast to drive fast cars, <laughs> chase fast cars, drive motorcycles, escort popes and presidents. Yeah. Uh, it, it was good. You know, anything uh, with wheels and I wanted a piece of it. Yeah, no doubt. Well, you've gone on to do some really cool things that we're going to learn about. And as I said earlier, thank you for your service the New York City Police Department. Not an easy job uh, serving the public and dealing with a, a lot of challenging situations, but I would love to continue on this journey and start by asking you for a success quote or a mantra. This is some kind of saying that's been important to you. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tires smoking here on Cars. Yeah, so Rich, take the wheel. I've really only grasped this quote, say, within the last couple of years. Before that, I was always very uh, risk adverse. I would have all these great ideas and I would always keep them to myself or only tell some close friends and obviously nothing ever came of it. And then I heard this quote that uh, I'm sure all the listeners uh, know it by Wayne Gretzky. You know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And if you just think of the simplicity of that statement, yeah, you know, if you don't take the shot, you're losing. And if you take the shot, you still have a 50-50% chance that you're going to score. So what the heck? Take the shot. Take the shot. You know, I wish I'd known that in high school. I'd had a lot more dates, I think. I would <laughs> yeah, ask a lot more girls out. Both. <laughs> you both. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've heard that saying before from some of my guests here, and it's absolutely true. And so many times, you know, we're just self-imposed hindrances that we put on ourselves to not try something, not go out there and put ourselves out there. Um, I'm so glad that you've embraced that because so many of the things that we're going to talk about today, you've done would have never happened if you hadn't taken a shot. And my gosh, 
for a guy who's uh, set up with your buddy and and put a concord together. I mean, who who have thought that Car Week needed another concord, right? Much less uh, at a at a three hundred year old mission, right? I mean, how did you? Yeah. Uh, why did you do that one? That some people would go, "What? We need another one." Almost word for word, and and forgive me if it sounds like I'm repeating what you said, but that's the conversation we had the very first time I went uh, to the mission was right after uh, 9-11. We, we can get into that a little later. I, w- I was down there that day, you know, uh. first responder, I'm a survivor, all, all that stuff. Wow. And I was out visiting my friend Frank, who you mentioned earlier, and he took me to the Carmel Mission. And the place was just, you know, quiet, serene, very just angelic. One of the priests at the time, there were multiple, let me ring the uh, bells in, in the uh, tower. And nice. I just kind of like this, like, you know, you get this moment, you know, yeah. that aha moment. And I'm like, wow. And I just kind of fell in love with that place. And then a few years later, I went back out again to visit Frank during car week. And we went around to all the shows and the auctions and everything. And we wind up back, you know, for Sunday mass uh, before Pebble. And I'm like, Frank, look at this courtyard. Why don't we do a, a car show here in the courtyard? I mean, we've got this beautiful fountain and the cobblestone, you know, and 300 year old mission. I mean, just look at when they, you talk about location, location, location. I said, you know, Pebbles got theirs already. I said, but here. So what we did was we approached like the priest that was in charge at the time. And his answer was exactly what you said. We don't need another car show during car week. I'm like, okay. So we just kind of put that in our back pocket. And then a few years later, new priest took over and we approached the priest and say, um, father, we'd, uh, we'd like to do a car show here in the courtyard. What do you think? And he goes, it sounds like a great idea. Yeah. There and you go. that was the birth of the Carmel mission classic. Nice. You know, again, taking a shot. And even though you missed the first time you went back and took another shot and I'll tell the listeners, if you've not attended that during car week, it is, Exactly the way that Rich described it. It's peaceful, serene. It kind of it kind of calms you down a little bit for what is a very heck busy week. The setting is like being in an old part of Italy or something. I mean, you just feel so nice there. It's so relaxed. It's so easygoing. Cars are spectacular. Of course, the people during Car Week are all absolutely brilliant. So uh, I, we're all so glad that you did that. Let's go back in time a little bit and talk about a story that instigated your personal passion for cars. You kind of touched on it at the beginning there with your brother, I believe it was. But is there a pivotal moment in your life when you knew you were going to be a car guy? Um, I think it was, you know, one of those moments uh, with my brother. Like I said earlier, we were in, for those people on the East Coast, uh, we were at the old English town uh, drag strip. He took his everyday car. He had a 66 old Cutlass. And uh, we went down there with a couple of buddies of his, and he put on the racing tires and took out the seats to loosen up the weight and do all this stuff. And he was probably 17 or 18 at the time, so I was probably 10 or 11. And I just was like, this is so cool. Don't tell mom. (laughs) <laughs> you know, what he was doing to the car. Yeah. Okay. You know, so there was a little secrecy involved in it. Yeah, and then go up yeah. into the stands and watch them. And then uh, understanding, you know, cars were a lot faster, but how come, you know, you won and they lost and this and that. And, and getting to un- understand, you know, brackets and things like that. And I'm like, man, I like this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, and yeah. uh, that was when I got the car bug at a very early age. There you go. We'll blame your brother for that. Thank goodness yeah. he, was, he was around to spread that disease to you. Well, let's talk about some of the roads you've been down. Now, you've had some interesting career moves in your life. I mean, you're a police officer for a long time serving. Uh, Definitely met some challenges, maybe some failures there. I don't know where you want to go with this question, but I always like to ask it because it's a valuable learning tool when we go through these challenging times. I'd love for you to walk us through one of yours and tell us how that experience helped you move forward in your life and your business and your career. Well, Again, I kind of touched on it just a little bit earlier, but the uh, the events of September 11th, 2001. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was working that day. And, you know, uh, like I always say now, you know, just an, just another day at the office. Not, not a real good day at the office, but, you know, just another day at the office for cops. And I was standing on the corner of the North Tower when it came down oh. and uh, ran. And then, uh, like all good cops and firemen, you know, we went back in not to know that, oh, now the other tower is going to fall down. 
so, you know, it was an interesting day. It's actually, you know, as we just had the anniversary uh, here in September, yes, you know, there's yes. that uh, famous uh, video that was made by these two French brothers that were doing a documentary that they were following around the fire department that day. And, you know, I'm in it along with, uh, you know, my partner. And, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, you, you hope something like that never happens again. We were there. Uh, I lost, you know, two guys, the two cops that I worked with. And, um, you know, since then, we've actually lost, uh, I've lost a lot more friends from, um, you know, the illnesses and stuff. It's kind of like I say, it's this generation's Agent Orange. But through that adversity, you know, a few years later, I, you know, I retired. I did my 20 years and, and I retired. And that's when I kind of embraced that Wayne Gretzky quote that I mentioned earlier. You know what? You know, I could go to work tomorrow and have a building fall down on me, you know. Right. So let's take the shot. You yeah. know, and started, you know, it was a little bit of change in life and started being a little bit different. And, you know, the passion for cars was coming through as I was retiring and then segueing into other careers. And I just, you know, let that car bug be creative and just, yeah. you know, start knocking on doors and asking people questions. You want to do this? Can we do this? Yeah. Yeah. And Anything's got possible. Me where I am. My goodness. Number one, again, thanks for your service. I, I can't even begin to imagine having been there that day for that. And oh my gosh, how it changed the whole world, but but how it affected so many people on such an incredibly personal level. And for someone like you to have been there, plus to be a first responder, somebody that had couldn't run away, had to run into it, run into that disaster and deal with it. But no doubt... When you're faced with something with that magnitude, it does change the way it has to change you in the way you look at life. And I know being a police officer, I've had many friends who are officers, people that serve in the service, people that deal with challenging things every day. It does make you stop and think about how fragile life is, how important it is, and how important it is to make something of this time. I have a good buddy, Bill, who's a neurosurgeon. He's a regular listener. Shout out to Bill. And he always is telling me, you know what? If there's one thing I've learned from dealing with people every day that have accidents, they've been in car accidents, whatever, is every day really is a gift. It's a cliche, but it is because many of the yeah, people on his absolutely. table got up that morning just like you did on 9-11 and thought, just another day, and it was far from it. So thank you for sharing hey, a day your like time, that. It's your time, you know? I guess, I guess it wasn't it is. my time. No, thank goodness it wasn't, but uh, <laughs> thank goodness you were there, and I'm sure you helped a numerous amount of people that still think of you to this day because you were there to help them. So thank you for, for doing that and for sharing that. Thank you for saying that, Mark. Appreciate absolutely, that. absolutely. Let's shift gears and talk about a big career aha moment. Now, you've done some pretty cool things. You've been involved in some really cool things, and you've made some incredible things happen that would have never happened that so many of us got to enjoy. Is there a, a big aha moment in your life you can share that, that uh, really stands out for you? Well, the aha moment was... Uh when I told you the story earlier about when Frank and I approached the priest about doing the car show in the mission and he said, yes. And then we went back home and we actually thought about it and we're like, <laughs> we okay, really want to do this. We get ourselves into. <laughs> yeah. Because both of us have done, you know, car shows, like, like you mentioned in the intro, you know, my first, I was doing, you know, parking lot car shows in the uh, parish parking lot of St. Columbinus church where, you know, I got the, Typical Saturday night hot rod crowd and stuff. And Frank did similar stuff out there. And I'm like, if we're doing this, we've got to step it up a notch. How do you go from zero to 60 for your first year? And so it was just, it was an amazing challenge. And that's, I guess, the thing of being a cop and and being an operations type guy going back to like 9-11. Well, it just kicked, you just do. It just kicks in and you do it, you get it done and you don't worry about anything. You just, you know, you have a mission at hand and you do it. And so Frank and I kind of focused that to the mission and we sat down and we made a list and we started making phone calls. We need cars, we need cars, we need people, we need sponsors. And it it just kind of like snowballed, you know? So it, it went from that zero to the 60 was the first year we opened it. We had, I think, 52 cars we had six wineries doing tastings. We had a celebrity chef doing food. The mission is, is a, it's a landmark itself. There's actually a saint buried there, St. Junius of Para. 
like we like to say, you know, how many other car shows are held on the grounds of a 250 year old Spanish mission where a saint is buried, where you can enjoy wine, enjoy food, and, you know, something for the soul, something for the palate, you know, something for the eyes, just a little bit of something. We just like to say it's a relaxed atmosphere. We don't judge with a clipboard. We have celebrity judges that come every year. We want cars with a story. You know, nobody's walking around with a clipboard saying, you know, that's an aftermarket part. You know, those are the wrong bolts. Those are the wrong. No, we walk around, you know, tell us about the car. Tell us about your adventure. Like we had a car this year was a, a 1917 Franklin. The owners of the car, husband and wife, drove the car from Florida to California just to be in our show. Wow. They spent six weeks driving one way and six weeks going back the <laughs> oh other way. Gosh. A hundred year old car. Yeah. I mean, you know, so obviously, you know, they went home with a trophy for that. Of course. You know, that's a car with a story. And, and that's what we like. Yeah. You know, we, we don't uh, like we have featured marks like this year we had uh, five Porsches and we had four Ferraris. But we really don't feature particular group. We have custom cars. We have antique cars. We have hot rods. We had Indy race car. I mean, you know, 1919 Franklin. We, I mean, we, we have everything. It's, it's just a little something different. And like you said earlier, we just wanted a relaxed atmosphere. When you walk in, you get your ticket stub and you get an empty glass and just go relax and have a good time. Yeah. Have a nice glass of wine, hang out with some great people, take it easy. Yeah, it's uh it's a really wonderful event and you know I've had lots probably dozens now of Concord directors people who put on shows. Some of them I got to drop a few names here because they're just some amazing people that pull things off. Doug Friedman, Concord in the Avenue that happens on, on the, the Avenue, Tuesday you before your yours. Button you've had yeah, as a guest. Button. Yep. Rich Doucette from the Boston Classic back on the uh, East Coast near you. Tom McDowell, Concorso Italiano, Bill Warner, Melia Island, Michael Dervier, La Jolla yep. Concord. I mean the list goes on and on. And, you know, for anybody out there that thinks, oh, this is easy, <laughs> no, 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 it's not. No. Uh, but you can't do it without the great people that donate their time and help and the people that get involved that help you pull this thing off. But kudos to you and your buddy uh, for tackling this because uh, oh, this, it's, it's, oh, it's really amazing. You know, at the end of every show, everybody asks me, you know, Rich, did you have a good time? Mm -hmm. And I look at them and I'm like, I, I don't know. I said, did you have a good time? I said, that's what it's all about. I said, I didn't eat. I didn't drink. I didn't sit down. I, I equate it to planning your daughter's wedding. Yes. It's, it's a year of planning and preparation. Yeah. And in six hours, it's all over. It's all over. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I think next year when I come down there, I'm going to just, I'm going to bring you a glass of wine and say, hey, buddy, sit down. I did that. <laughs> I did that in essence with uh, Tom McDell at Concorso. We had the same conversation and I went up to him at Concorso this year and I said, are you relaxing a little bit? And he goes, I don't know. Am I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'll be very honest with you. In the six years of the show, I haven't had a sip of wine. Well, there's just I, no time. I think there's we better. No I think we better change that next year. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna make my goal. At least you can get a sip of wine. Yeah, and uh, ring a bell. I think so. Well, let's you have a, let's have a little bit of fun. Talk about your first really special car. Uh, that first car in your life that had great meaning for you. You know, uh, listeners are going to be surprised that, you know, it's not a, you know, a Ferrari. It's not a Duesenberg. It's not, you know, this real famous car. The car, again, that helped solidify me being a car guy was our family car. It was a 1964 Mercury Monterey Breezeway. And I don't know if you even know the car. It's very, you know, limited in numbers. But it had a Breezeway window, which meant it had kind of like, a, it was a four-door sedan yeah. uh -huh. and the rear window angled in and it was like the old station wagon windows yes and it went down into the back seat yep yep and i know the car well for air conditioning you open the vent windows in the front put the breezeway down and that was your air conditioning yeah but uh a time that really was like this is the coolest thing in the world i was small my brother was still small he wasn't driving yet and we were on the new york state thruway coming home from uh, upstate somewhere and there was an army convoy this was in the i don't remember the year but it was like it was definitely late 60s early 70s it was 
during the uh, Vietnam War, probably yeah. when it was starting up, and hundreds of trucks, and me and my brother were leaning out the back window onto the trunk <laughs> of the car. God forbid you do that nowadays. You yeah, know? yeah, your parents we would be leaning out the put car. in jail for child endangerment. Uh, <laughs> before car seats and all that stuff, and yeah. me and my brother just, you know, like tugging your arm up in the air and they're blowing the air horns on the trucks and we're waving to all the soldiers and they're in the back of the trucks and they're waving at us. And I just like, I had such a cool time in a car, Yeah, you know? And I was like, this is cool. I like yeah. this car stuff. Yeah, the Breezeway was a pretty, pretty cool, unique car. I mean, very different the way that back window sloped back and went down into the back seat. So yeah, very, very cool car. Remember those well. I worked with a guy years ago who had one of those as a daily driver. And he was a young guy. You know, it's kind of a interesting car for a young guy to be driving, but he just, uh, he loved that thing. So very cool. I had about half a dozen of them in my lifetime once I got my license. Yeah, wow, that's a very whole nice. other story. There yeah. you go. Well, how about seller's remorse? Is there a car you've let go you really wish you had back? You know, I had um, an 85 Mustang GT in uh, red and black. Mm-hmm. And that was, I call it my coming of age car in my early 20s. I had a lot of fun with it. I had so much fun with it. My best friend got a Mustang. Then nice. another close friend got a Mustang. And then Mark got his Mustang. And <laughs> out of a group of six of us that were inseparable, four of us had Mustangs. Nice. And, you know, the things we would do with those cars and stuff, we, we lived near uh, an abandoned air base in Brooklyn called uh, Floyd Bennett Field. And we were able to go out there and the police department, now this was before I became a cop, uh, the police department had their driver training course out there. Oh, okay. Well, on the weekends, nobody's there. Right. So we would take our Mustangs yeah. around all the cones and stuff. Oh, okay, and, cool. Um, it, yeah. it was a lot of fun. So, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm like, you know, you just yearn back to, you know, the good old days. And yeah, yeah you know. I'd Fun like times. my Mustang again. Yeah, Mustangs are cool. I had a 66 Fastback that was built to look like a GT350 Shelby. And uh, it was ah, just a wonderfully fun car. Everybody would always stop and want to talk to you about it. Mustangs are just, uh, they're kind of like VW bugs. They just put a smile on people's faces. Well, what are you working on that has you excited and fired fired up, I should say, coming up in the near future? I mean, you've got your hands in a lot of different things. So tell us a little bit about something that has you excited. Well, if I can just touch on an event I did last October, then that'll kind of lead me to what's cooking now. Um, in, in October of 2017, I organized the Peekskill Vintage Grand Prix. Peekskill is a, a Hudson River town just north of uh, New York, about 50 miles north of New York City. I was able to convince the uh, the city government, the uh, the insurance companies, uh, and everybody along the way that this was a good idea, and it would be great for the economy, for tourism, and it, it was all of those. What we did was we, we shut down, in essence, the city for the day. I created a two-mile course that went through the downtown business district and then down along the Hudson River and back up. And we got all the local businesses and restaurants on board and they put tables and chairs out at the curb. And it was kind of like a throwback to Mil Amelia, uh, you know, the Monaco Grand Prix where you you saw people just, you know, hanging out, having lunch and a spot of tea or maybe a glass of wine (laughs) as the cars were going by. Yeah. So it was called a vintage Grand Prix, but it wasn't a true Grand Prix. There was there was absolutely no racing. There was no passing allowed. Uh, What we did was we put four groups together. We had an American group of cars, a British group of cars, a a European group, and a classic group we called for cars that kind of like just didn't fit in really any other category. And everybody went out and they had uh, about a half hour of time just just to ride around town and have a good time. Like I said, there was no passing, so that kept everybody uh, in check. I said it was a spirited ride. It was just an opportunity, no stoplights, no stop signs, just an opportunity where guys don't do that. Living in New York, you know, or actually anywhere, you know, eventually you're going to run into a stop sign. You're going to run into a traffic light. You're going to run into something, cars coming out of a driveway. So I had the entire city set down for this. And what we did was, 
through friends in the police department there, we had two motorcycle cops riding around the course with the cars. Oh, So in case fun. somebody was having a little bit too much fun, that's exactly what the <laughs> cops would say. You're having a little bit too much fun. And that was all the people needed. We weren't there, you know, they weren't there to give out tickets or anything. It was just, it was a nice, nice time. And, and the, the woman that won, we only gave out one amazing award. It was a 90-year-old woman driving an MG. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it, it was her son's car. Mm -hmm. The son bought it about 30 years earlier, was trying to restore it. Unfortunately, he became ill and, and passed away. Oh, no. Mom kept the car, restored it, and started driving it in all these MG events to pay tribute to him. She even had the car shipped overseas wow. to uh, Britain to enter events and stuff. And... She hasn't had, she hasn't been to like an event in over a year and a half. She got to this event and by the second lap, the smile on her face <laughs> as she was shifting, going around the corners. And, and again, it was like, how do you not give a person like this a I'm trophy? Bored. And she yeah. came up to me at the end, she grabbed my arm and she says, Richie, she says, I, I don't know how many years I've been driving this car. She says, this is the most fun I've ever had with it. I knew that my son was with me today, yeah. enjoying this day. And, and I don't know if you could hear it in my voice. I'm, yes. I'm a sentimental fool, but of course, I'm getting of choked. Course. Like, yeah. It was like, that was it, you know? So did I have a good time? Absolutely. You know, yeah. when somebody like that told me they had a good time, then that event was worth it. Ah. Doing that last year is leading me now to the next big thing. And the next big thing is going to be the Central Park Vintage Grand Prix. Oh. And if anybody is familiar with New York City and yeah. our lovely Central Park, yeah. Central Park was closed to vehicular traffic this year. So no cars are allowed in Central Park anymore. Okay. It's just for yeah. the uh, pedestrians, the bicyclists, the joggers, and the horses. Mm hmm so we're in uh, negotiations now with uh, all the powers to be in uh, New York City and the Parks Department to allow us to do a similar type event through the uh, the roadway in Central Park to bring, you know, about 100 uh, vintage cars and to have a, a spirited ride, which you can't do anymore right. around Central Park. Whoa, Rich, you are <laughs> taking shots, my friend. Wow, that is something you gotta else. You got to go for it. You got to go for it. Well, we wish you the absolute best success. And when this all comes to fruition, which I'm sure it will, you got to come back, tell us more about it. But uh, man, this sounds like... Well, you got to come to the event and see it for yourself. I do. I got to get back to New York City. Haven't been there in a while. So I've got to get back. Man, that sounds cool. Well, here's a very introspective question for you, Rich. If you woke up tomorrow and you were a car... What would you be? Yeah, that's an easy one. I, I've heard you ask, you know, <laughs> all of your guests that question, and everybody's got to think, and, oh, and they run down a list. And, you know, with my background and the stories I've told you, it's easy. I want to be a 1986 Plymouth Grand Fury cop car. Oh, cool. <laughs> I, I love had it. so much fun in that type of car as a cop. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say they were indestructible. But you could really beat the pants <laughs> off of those cars. They weren't the fastest, but like I would tell people, you know, on the highways of New York City, you may be able to outrun the car, but you're never going to outrun the radio. No, never. Uh -uh. You know, <laughs> um, but those cars were true workhorses. Yeah. And, you know, you could pile it with uh, people and, and equipment. We would push cars out of it. We had these big, big, I think they were almost two and a half feet tall by like eight inches wide, two of them on the front push bumpers. That's when cars had big chrome, you know, bumpers in the front. And then we had these big black rubber push bumpers in front of that. I mean, I've even pushed a cement truck off the highway with one of these cars. <laughs> nice. And I'm like, they're a workhorse for life. Yeah. And that's what I think I am. I'm I just going to so. work until, you know, there's no more gas in the tank or oil in the engine. And yeah. That's what a Grand Fury is to me. Very nicely said. I love it. Well, Rich, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars yeah sponsors. Everyone who knows me knows I'm really picky when it comes to my cars and keeping them looking new. I'm a huge fan of Covercraft floor mats. I've protected my vehicle with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft floor mats. They will protect your vehicle's factory carpets from daily abuse, weather, pets, children, weekend adventures, and those everyday spills. 
It's a fast, easy, and stylish way to keep your vehicle looking new. Covercraft floor mats come in a wide variety of styles, materials, and configurations, all designed for maximum protection. In addition to Premier Plush and Berber Custom Floor Mats, you'll also find cargo liners, canine cargo area liners, dash covers, and sunscreens. Enhance your vehicle's looks while protecting the factory finishes with easy-to-install and easy-to-clean floor mats. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. What's every automotive enthusiast's dream? To design and build that perfect garage. My friends at Metron Garage are a group of creative talents who've combined their passion for cars with their careers in architecture. Their service includes unique garage design and state-of-the-art fabrication. They will create the coolest custom garage for you and your vehicles. Metron Garage's system features fully engineered commercial-grade material and structural framing that's stronger than traditional construction. Their designs are pre-engineered to meet your building codes for fast, bolt-together construction. With over 25 years of experience, you'll see a 3D rendering to visualize your custom garage, and the final structure will fulfill all your storage needs. Contact Metron Garage today and begin realizing your dream garage. Go to MetronGarage.com. That's MetronGarage.com. Garage is built for discerning enthusiasts. Where it's not just a garage, it's where your dream garage comes true. Okay, Rich, we're back and we're entering the last lap through Central Park. Let's put it that way. I'm going to fire (laughs) off a series of questions. And ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? I don't know if it was the best, but it was the most poignant. And again, it goes back to my brother in his drag racing days and that first time down at Englishtown Drag Strip. And I'm seeing all these cars that were a lot faster than his and a lot that were slower than his. And him and his buddy were changing tires. And I'm like, you know, can you go faster? And you know, can you do, what, what else can you do to make the car go faster? And he just looks at me and he goes, well, how fast do you want to go? <laughs> and then his best friend looks at me and says, well, how much money do you have? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, okay. You know, years later that that sunk in that, you know, it's true. It's like you can really do anything in the car culture. It, yeah. You know, how much do you have? How, how much, much do you want to spend? Exactly. You know, you get to your limit, your threshold, and that's great. There's always going to be another guy with more money. I know? know. No matter how big your boat or airplane is, there's always that other guy with the bigger boat, the bigger airplane. So Exactly. Now, about personal habits, is there one that stands out for you that you think has been a contributor to your successes? Yeah. I, I kind of live by, obviously, be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, be humble, be honest, and be relentless. You know, just keep going for it. There you go. Now, how about a resource? There are awesome resources for us car folks these days. Is there one that stands out for you? I go to a buddy of mine who you've had on the show. He, he's kind of like my go-to car guy, uh, Don Weberg yeah, from Garage Don. Style Magazine. Yep. Yep. And, Love Don. And Don and I have become great friends over the last 10 years or so. And I can't tell you how many hours. Thank God you don't pay for... Uh, Long distance phone calls anymore. <laughs> yes. Um, but between living in New York and putting on the Carmel Mission Classic, you know, and talking to Don, who's also uh, in Southern California. But Don's like my go to guy. Whenever I have a question, you know, should, should I do this? Should I not do this? What do you think? He's there. Uh, if I have, obviously, the car question. Oh, yeah. He either knows it or I got a guy. We all car guys have other car guys that are experts in, you know, Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis, you know. Uh, so Don's a great resource in Garage Town Magazine. is a great magazine. Uh, they have newsletters. You go to the website and stuff. I give Don a shout out if uh, you let me, Mark. Appreciate Absolutely. that. But yeah, yeah. Don's my go-to guy. Absolutely. Don Weberg. You can check out his show here on Cars Yeah on my website, Garage Style Magazine. Check out the magazine. He travels all over the place and Visits people with really cool garages, so uh, check it out. We'll make sure we put a link to that on Rich's show notes page. Now, if I could arrange for you to sit in and have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would that person be? John DeLorean. Oh, yeah. I had a few people mention John DeLorean. And in fact, I had uh, Barry Wills, who worked with John from the very beginning when he started the DeLorean Car Company. He was literally the last guy out the door when everything shut down, wrote a great book about my life with John DeLorean. Uh, yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? Interesting. His name's come up a lot lately. 
he's what I consider like, you know, those monikers I just gave you about being passionate. You know, I mean, he started his career at Packard, you know, went to GM, built the GTO. Then we need a Mustang fighter. He built the Firebird. And then when he left GM and he started the DeLorean Motor Company. And then, you know, and this is the cop in me. You know, I, I, if I say admire, don't be too judgmental. I admire his passion that the man was willing to sell himself out. You know, he sold himself to the devil to do an illegal act. But what was the, what was the driving force in that? You know, like in a criminal matter, you need intent. He didn't have intent. If you ask me, he had passion and it was what to save the company. It wasn't to make money so he can go on a vacation or buy a a car or a yacht. It was to save his company. And and from stories I've just read recently, you know, in in his later years, he, he found Christ which is a great thing, just like a, another uh, person I look up to, Steve McQueen, you know, found Christ a, at the end of his life. But I also read that John DeLorean, till his dying day, was trying to come up with another version of his DMC, you know, to come out with another car to the day he died. And I'm like, you know what? That's a car guy, yeah. you know? Yeah, he was a car and guy. I'd love to have a drink and a cigar with him. That would be something. Well, how about a book? Is there a book you'd like to share that you've really enjoyed? Yeah, just uh, like, I, like I said, I touched on, you know, Steve McQueen, you know, finding Christ in his later years. Greg Laurie, who's a, a real famous pastor uh, from the Harvest Ministries out in um, San Diego. He wrote a book called Steve McQueen, The Salvation of an American Icon. Mm. It's a story about Greg doing his research because Greg also wrote a movie. Uh, wrote, uh, wrote, produced, directed a movie about Steve McQueen ah, called okay. Same Thing, Steve McQueen, American Icon, about his later years. Everybody thought that he, he found you know Christ when he found out he was dying. He, he actually did that years earlier. Uh-huh. So Greg, being a minister, had a very similar upbringing. No father around, alcoholic mother, you know, in and out of foster care, foster right. homes. And Greg's life kind of paralleled. And Greg owns a Bullet Tribute Mustang. So the book talks about how he would get in the car after the church on Sunday. He'd hop in the car Monday morning, drive halfway across the country to try and visit and interview people about Steve McQueen's life for this book. So, you know, if you're a car guy, it's great. And, and you don't even have to be, you know, a, a Christian. You don't even have to be spiritual. It, it's just one man's desire, determination. Yeah, and that's what I love about Steve McQueen and, and this book. Yeah, very nice. Well, that's the first time that book's been recommended. And I'll remind our listeners, I had Steve's son, Chad, on the show twice now here on Cars Yeah. And uh, there's a car show that happens up in Chino uh, that helps the Boys Republic, a bunch of wayward kids that really need help. Chad puts that on every year. His dad kind of started it. And some of his dad's estate still funds that. They raise money to help the Boys Republic and help young kids that really need some guidance, just like Steve McQueen got when he was a boy. Uh, and look where that ended up. Well, very nicely said. Well, listen, we are up to the checkered flag here, Rich, and this last question can be a bit of a doozy, but it's kind of a fun thought. I'm going to buy you any cool collector car in the world today, but there's some rules to this game. You can't sell it to buy a bunch of other cars with. You got to drive it. I want you to use it, but I know that's no problem for you. And money is no object. So what can I buy you? You know what? You you don't have to go, uh, you don't have to break the bank, but I think just to me, like, an all-time just classic car to me, uh, E-Type Jaguar. Ah, nice. To me, it just says motoring. The tagline I like to use now on you know on my website and my events is stuff, and it's just after all, cars are made to be driven. You know, so it's okay to have a trailer queen. It's okay to have, you know, cars at at the concourse. You know, everybody has an everyday driver. And to me, the E-Type can, you know, depending on what year might make, you know, it's somewhere in the middle. You can use it a lot, you know, and it just says you're motoring. You're (laughs) enjoying life. Nice, nice choice. Love the E-Type. That's the car that started it for me that instilled my passion as a young boy. Yep. My dad bought me a little matchbox. Uh, by Lesney, an E-Type Jaguar. Still have it sitting here right on my desk. Think of my dad every day. Uh, yeah, Very cool. The Jaguar. Well, Rich, you've taken me on an awesome ride today. I knew you would. I've really enjoyed your stories. Thanks for sharing them with the Cars Yeah audience. Is there one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance you might offer us before you rip off into the sunset 
maybe through Central Park in that E-Type Jaguar. <laughs> well, uh, the, the very last line is something I say uh, to all my buddies when we go uh, on a motorcycle ride. But to preface it, it's believe in yourself. You know, the guy upstairs does. Uh, it's just set a goal for yourself and go for it. And remember, it's not the destination. It's the drive. Absolutely. What's the best way for our listeners to follow along with you and learn more about all the things you're up to? Uh, you can go to my website. It's rspeppy.events. And uh, we've got my past shows on there. And as soon as we get some stuff about Central Park, we'll be putting it up there. Absolutely. I'll make sure I put a link to that on Rich's show notes page on the Cars yeah website. So check it out. Of course, if you're planning on going to Car Week next August, you got to visit the Mission Classic. I mean, it's just a wonderful event. you got to add it to your list of all the things to do there. Can't wait to hear more about this uh, Central Park driving event that you're going to put together. That sounds great. Awesome. Well, Rich, thanks for being so generous today with your time, your expertise, and for sharing your experiences with Cars Yeah. Until you and I talk again, I'm sure I'll see you down the road. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. You're welcome. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important, too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy, too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.